Welcome to Too Fond of Books. My name is Janelle, and in this video, I am going to share three different books. Uh, I read um, a com The Comedy of Errors for ShakeTube 2020, and I also read a historical mystery that kind of played around with The Comedy of Errors, and I read a short story directly connected to The Comedy of Errors. And so I thought I would do a video where I talked about all three of those things. So um, let's drink some coffee and have a chat about Shakespeare. Now The Comedy of Errors is a Shakespeare play that I have not read before, and I've also never seen a, a pl the play itself or any adaptation of it, so I was unfamiliar with the story. So uh, this is my Shakespeare. It is the edition of the Shakespeare Head Press Oxford, uh, the complete works. So it is a monster of an edition, but I like that it has everything in it. Now, the comedy of errors. I am going to try and give you an idea of what this play is about, but it is super complicated. So we have a set of twins that are born, boys, to a, um, to a couple and they hire uh, or buy, I'm not entirely sure, <laughs> another set of twins to be servants to these boys. So we have two sets of twins, all of them are male. And for some weird reason, the twins each have the same name. So the two, the two uh, original sets of twins have they're both called the same thing, and then their servants are also both called a different name, but the same thing. Okay, so those twins with their parents are traveling by sea, and um, there's a storm, and the twins and the parents get separated. One of the twins ends up with the father, one of the twins ends up with the mother. Years later, one of these twins with his servants decides to go out and try and find his brother. Now, when this play opens, all of this stuff happens before even the opening of the play. When the play opens, everybody manages to converge in Ephesus at the same time. And that's where the comedy of errors comes into play. So you have... Um, I'm going to give you the names so that it doesn't get super as complicated as uh, as it could be. So you have Antipholus, and in order to keep them separate, you have Antipholus of Ephesus and Antipholus of Syracuse, and then their servants, Dromino of Ephesus and Dromino of Syracuse. And so, of course, these are identical twins, um, and so everybody ends up converging on Ephesus at the same time. The father, Aegon, arrives uh, from Syracuse. He arrives in Ephesus and there has been some kind of law, and I'm not sure why, but anybody who comes to Syracuse from Ephesus um, and is caught is going to be put to death um, unless they can pay like this huge amount of, amount of money. And so Aegon has been caught and he is uh, set to die that evening or something. Meanwhile, Antiphasis of Syracuse is on Ephesus and he has been trying to find his brother who has been living in Ephesus. And of course this brother, Antiphasis of Ephesus, has married and so all of these things happen where like the wife sees the wrong twin and thinks it's her husband and then her sister, the same thing happens to her and stuff with servants and of course. So it's, um, it's you know, this hilarious comedy of errors and in the end it all gets wrapped up because guess who is also on Ephesus? Their mother who turns out to be the abbess um, and yeah. So it all, it all turns out well in the end. Um, this was pretty confusing for a play and I can imagine that if you watched it, it might be quite confusing as well. Now, there was a, um, an adaptation that I was gonna watch. Um, the BBC did a whole series of all the Shakespeare plays and the adaptation that I was gonna watch is from the 80s. 
Um, but I gave up on it right away because I didn't like, I just didn't really like um, the adaptation. And one thing um, that just seemed, it added to the confusion was they had the same actor playing both sets of twins. So the same actor played um, Antiphysis, Antiphilus of Ephesus and Antiphilus of Syracuse. And then the same thing with Dromino, the servants. And so it was just super confusing to try and keep everyone separate. I think it would have worked better if um, you had, you know, actors that looked slightly similar, but some way for the audience anyway to keep them apart. But anyway, it was Shakespeare. It was entertaining. Um, it, it's an early Shakespeare play. Um, and so it had, you know, uh, a lot of, uh, you could see kind of, some of the stuff that would be coming later in Shakespeare. It's not my favorite and I don't think it ever will be my favorite, but I'm glad that I'm glad that I read it. And then I read um, Simon Hawke's A Mystery of Errors. This is the first in his Shakespeare and Smythe mystery series. Um, and this takes place um, in about let me see if I can remember, but the like the mid 1500s, late 1500s, mid 1500s, I think it's what they called during the lost years when they don't really know what was happening with Shakespeare. Anyways, Shakespeare is on his way to London and he meets uh, a guy called <laughs> Symington Smythe. I'm not joking. <laughs> And the two of them uh, kind of decide to travel together to get to London. Now, Symington Smythe uh, also, he wants to become a player. And so uh, he was very excited to meet up with Shakespeare, who wants to become a poet and a writer and join a company of players. Um, and so it took me a little bit uh, to get into how how this was connected to the uh, Com the comedy of errors, but it totally is. I mean, it involves twins. It involves getting the twins mixed up. Um, and so it was just a really fun little historical mystery that included Shakespeare as a character, which I always find entertaining. Kit Marlowe is in here and some of the other players that Shakespeare was connected with, Burbage and Will Kemp and all of that stuff. And so, um, I just, it was a really fun little historical mystery and um, I've already put the second one on hold at the library. Um, I noticed, there was a few things I noticed in here. So the author really did uh, kind of want to, uh, he gave a nod to Shakespeare in that he included a lot of quotes that Shakespeare would later write in his plays. Um, but he also did some things and I think it's on purpose where there was some rhyming in, in the story and it always took place in dialogue and in Shakespeare's plays, of course, that happens at the end of a scene and that didn't, it didn't always happen at the end of a scene, which is what confused me. But let me read you a couple of these and then you can see if you agree with me or not. So here's an example. Good evening, Freddy, said Burbage, dispelling the illusion with the entirely prosaic name. The hour is growing late, I know, but we have come to see your wife, if we may. Freddy, for all the amiability of his name, appeared to have an expression that was perpetually grim and somber. He nodded gravely and replied, Meg is always pleased to see you, Master Richard. Allow me to light your way. May, way. I just really have, I just noticed it. And so I, um, I you know, watched for it. And so a little bit later, we get this. Instead, he held his temper, took a deep breath and said, you are quite right. I have been making a thoroughgoing mess of it. I shall try once more and I shall keep trying until I get it right. Will Kemp sighed dramatically. Send out for victuals, he said. We may be here all night. See? Now tell me in the comment section down below if you think that I am just totally crazy and seeing things that aren't really there. Here's one more example. How curious, said Shakespeare, turning to look, turning back to look at the group. I have heard it said that ghosts walk at the witching hour, but I have never heard of one who went abroad in daylight. Smythe jumped down off the stage to the ground. I do not understand this. Elizabeth said she saw him killed last night. 
See? I don't know. And then at the end, the author had a note, an afterword, that I wanted to read a little bit of because I found it really very interesting. It may be thought the height of arrogance to use William Shakespeare as a fictional character in a novel, and I imagine there will probably be those who will curl their lips with disdain at the idea, but at the same time I have a strong suspicion that Shakespeare would have approved, or at the very least been rather amused by the whole thing. After all, it is precisely the sort of thing he did himself. I do not, I should say right up front, make any pretense to being a serious literary scholar or critic on the subject of the Bard. While I have some knowledge and I have done some research for my own enjoyment and as part of working on this book and teaching Shakespeare in college level, English courses, there are numerous authorities whose knowledge of Shakespeare and his plays far exceed my own. My purpose here was really just the same as Shakespeare's, no more, no less, to entertain. I am by no means the first to use the bard in such a manner, nor I am sure shall I be the last. In this regard, I am certainly no less derivative than Shakespeare was himself when he based his works on other sources, such as the Chronicles of Hollingshead, when he chose to borrow from history, or the works of Green or Nash or Marlowe when he chose to steal outright. What I have tried to teach my students in order to help make Shakespeare more accessible to them is that if he were alive today, William Shakespeare would probably be known unpretentiously as Bill to his friends, and there's a good chance he'd be on the writing staff of some TV time, primetime television show like Melrose Place, or perhaps a soap opera such as The Days of Our Lives. <laughs> That's an interesting thought, isn't it? This book was written in 2000, by the way. I really do believe that. He would doubtless fit right in at a Hollywood power lunch with Stephen J. Cannell and David Kelly, with whom he would feel very comfortable talking shop and he might write script for Spielberg or Lucas or whoever hired him to write a screenplay. In short, he would be exactly what he was in his own time and what Dickens was in his, a working writer without any literary pretensions, one who simply practiced his craft, as Balzac said, with clean hands and composure. This is not to say that I am trying in any way to denigrate Shakespeare by comparing him to Hollywood scriptwriters, which many scholars would probably consider blasphemy, nor necessarily elevate them by a comparison to him. Marshall, Marshall McLuhan, I think, was wrong. The medium is not the message. Genius will always transcend the medium or else exalt it, much as Patty Chayefsky and Stanley Kubrick and Orson Welles did. From everything I know of him, and to a large degree, subjectively from what I feel, I think that Shakespeare would have been amazed beyond belief at the effects he has produced and the impact he has made at the immortality he has achieved. Certainly he never sought any such thing. I know writers today who never throw anything away, who obsessively keep copies of every marked up draft and every note ever scribbled on a napkin in a bar on the off chance that someday these things may be worth something, if not in a material sense, at least in an academic one, as papers to be donated to some university for further bibliographical and biographical research. Future doctoral candidates need never worry, for there will be no dearth of manuscripts and notes for them to sift through en route to stultifying dissertations. Shakespeare, on the other hand, never saved a thing. If not for his printers, we would probably have nothing for immortality was the last thing on his mind, and I doubt that the idea would even have occurred to him. He knew that his medium was an ephemeral one, and he regarded it accordingly. He wrote his works to be performed, not deconstructed in a college classroom or analyzed with pathological precision for every possible nuance and interpretation. He understood without a doubt that his was a collaborative medium, that actors would bring their own contributions to the table, that plays were a dynamic group effort of the entire company, not a showcase for an individual writer's talent and or ego. Students who are forced to sit through agonizing lectures by monotonous professors who drone on and on about iambic pentameter and heroic couplets never truly learn to appreciate the bard, and more's the pity, because Shakespeare himself would have been aghast to learn that his words were putting young captive audiences to sleep. He wanted more than anything to make them laugh or weep or rage, to make them feel, for that was why Elizabethan audiences went to the theater. They went looking for a bit of escapism, some amusement, a little entertainment. They wanted simply 
a good time. And Shakespeare became Shakespeare because he knew just how to give it to them. The irony of his career is that while he became indisputably the best known storyteller in the world, he is one of the least known when it comes to the story of his life. And then he ends the afterword with these words. My treatment of Shakespeare is pure conjecture based upon subjective inference. I painted him, to paraphrase Mr. Burbage, the way I would have liked to see him. Most readers will, I hope, find it merely fun, har merely harmless fun. As Shakespeare might have said himself, and did, if we shadows have offended, think but this, and all is mended that you have but slumbered here while these visions did appear, and this weak and idle theme no more yielding than a dream. Gentles do not reprehend. If we pardon, we will mend." And that's from Puck's speech at the end of A Midsummer Night's Dream. So I thought that was some very interesting thoughts about Shakespeare and a very entertaining uh, book and what I hope will be series. So I'll let you know what I think of the second book when it arrives. And then I read a short story from this, Shakespeare's Detectives, edited by Mike Ashley. And the story was um, Stolen Affections by Lawrence Schimmel and Jeffrey Marks. Um, and there's a, a little description at the beginning which I thought was interesting. The Comedy of Errors, which was first performed in 1593, is set at about the same time as Pericles. It starts out as a tragedy, though the improbability of the events soon twists it into a comedy. To reveal too much about the play, however, will also reveal too much about the following story. Suffice it to say it is set in Ephesus, where Egon of Syracuse has come in search of his sons and has been arrested because of the rivalry between Ephesus and Syracuse. The two sons have long been separated and do not know each other. One of them, Antipholus of Ephesus, is married, but finds himself debarred from his house. Now let the story take over. So this is a short story that kind of starts at that moment in the play when Ant Antipholus has been debarred from his house. And then his wife, in the short story, his wife sends her sister out to try and see if her husband is seeing another woman. And then the story basically does follow the plot of the play, but it's all from this sister's perspective. And this short story was okay, but I didn't really feel like it added anything. Um, it was this, basically it was the same, um, but it just highlighted her, um, uh, encounters with both of the twins and then um, she kind of picks up on stuff and guesses stuff before everybody else does in the play. So it was okay but I don't know you could just read the play I think. So anyway that was my trilogy of works connected to the Comedy of Errors. Did you read the Comedy of Errors for Shake Tube 2020? What are your thoughts on the story? Um, have you read either of these, uh, the, the book or the short story? Uh, let's chat about it in the comment section down below and I will see you for another video soon. Bye.